so nice to see you in the flesh here in Stockholm, Kate. For those who don't know you, can you start off by sharing? Who are you? Well, I'm Kate Vitasic, a faculty member at the University of Tennessee's Graduate and Executive Education Program. And I like to tell people I have the coolest job in the world because I get to study really complex buyer-supplier relationships and dig into why they're really successful or why they don't work. And so it's been a wonderful experience over the last 15 years making um, strategic buyer-supply relationships my specialty. And you've just released another book because you, you've released several. Can you share a bit about what it, what is it all about? Well, fantastic question. This is actually my sixth book. And this one we've branched out. You know, in the previous five books, we've dug really, really deep into strategic, highly collaborative relationships. We call it vested or vested outsourcing. And in this book, we take a step back. And I have a wonderful co-author, Bonnie Keith, who is a former chief procurement officer for PepsiCo and ABB. So she brings this rich practitioner experience as well as a couple other co-authors. And what we wanted to do was look at the entire continuum of what you bought. So we have, you know, if you think about this continuum of, you know, very um, commodity, you're buying pens and pencils over here and um, highly complex, complicated things on this side. You know, I tend to be on this side around the highly complex um, relationships. So we want to step back and look at the work we had done around sourcing as a business model for these complex deals. And could you apply that logic that sourcing is a business model regardless of where you are on the continuum. And obviously this happened a lot in the in the past 20 or 30 years within sourcing and procurement and in the book you talk about the new economy's effect. What is that? Well, there are many factors now that weren't around 10, 20, 30 years ago when many of the quote modern tools that we've built our entire procurement processes around were built. And business, for example, outsourcing. You know, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't really do much outsourcing. Today, we have very large strategic outsourcing relationships. Um, where our supplier is really the extension of ourself. Think about all the call center work and you know the facilities management work where you've really offloaded that and you need your supplier to be more strategic with you. Or you could think of them as just a janitor, right? You're just buying custodial services or I'm buying integrated facilities and real estate. So which is it? Which is right? Um, another thing is that business is much more dynamic and risky than it had been in the past. As we move to more global relationships, I mean, here in Stockholm, I flew in and I flew through Paris today, and two Air France planes were, you know, um, uh, uh, delayed and had to be grounded because of, of terrorists. Uh, and so you think, wow, we have a lot of risks that we didn't have before, borders. Um, you know, uh, workers with different languages, skills, and so we need to think about how we enact with uh, enact and act with our suppliers in these more dynamic environments that are more strategic now, and often hundreds of thousands of miles away, or actually thousands of miles away. Mm. And you mentioned the tools. Can you say something about what tools you were you, you are referring to and what might be missing or what might be added to make them work in, in the way that we run businesses today? Well, if you look at organizations and the most popular of the procurement tools, uh, one of the things that we learned from 1979 with um, Michael Porter was to leverage. Remember the competitive um, forces, the five forces. And he says that we really need to um, understand the com competition and the strength that we have over our suppliers or as a customer. And so that really taught us back in the 1970s and 80s to leverage our power, right? So it's all about leveraging our power and trying to gain power over your suppliers. And then comes along Peter Krejcik, right? And so he, um, in his wonderful matrix, which tons of companies use, he's got the wonderful two by two matrix, right? He says, okay, so up here's your strategic suppliers and over here's your leverage. 
suppliers and here's your non-critical and down here's your bottleneck. Well, what are we taught? We're taught to segment our suppliers, which is a wonderful thing, but I think it's incomplete because these strategic suppliers, what are you told? Go leverage them, commoditize them, right? So leverage your buying power and then shift them down to commodities. So we've lost the value that these suppliers can create because we've commoditized and in some cases over commoditized these suppliers. And the same thing with bottleneck suppliers. Oh, they're risky suppliers, so therefore you need to diversify and don't really get close with those suppliers because they can hurt you. And so we have this fear and this power-based philosophy with bringing in some of Porter's and, and Krawczyk's uh, philosophies. And then let's step back and look at a third tool that's really been wonderful and has brought great value to the industry. But again, I think it's complete, and that's the um, multi-step procurement processes. The most popular is probably the A.T. Kearney seven-step model, right? And it teaches that procurement is a, st is a series of steps. And again, I think that's done some wonderful things for our profession, but it's incomplete because when you think about especially bringing in strategic outsourcing relationships, those aren't a once and done, throw it over the fence. It's, it is a cycle. So I like to think of procurement as a sourcing cycle. It's a continuous effort. So you have renewals. You may want to go in and the market's changing. So as um, your underlying components of the dynamic uh, market factors happen, you need to come in and constantly be reevaluating those strategies, those category strategies, and thinking of them as a cycle instead of just these steps. And most of the seven step or eight step or six or 12 steps, whichever one you're adopting, it, it stops. And now one thing that is great is people are starting to add on SRM or supplier relationship management. So that closes a big gap, but it's not do the procurement, throw it over to SRM. It really is that cycle. Mm. And I guess that many procurement managers and supply chain managers, they would argue that they do this already. They aim at creating value rather than just exchanging money, if you will, transactions. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions? At what are they missing in the picture? Would you say in general, not all, of course, but what could be added? What is that value that you're talking about? Well, I think uh, actually Peter Krawczyk said it best when folks uh, interviewed him for his 25 years after his original 1983 article came out. He says, if you had to go back and do it again, what would you? What advice would you have to, if you could rewrite that article? And he says that we need trust to build supplier relationships. And I think what we've done is have, um, had, have these relationships that are buy-sell, as you mentioned, transactional, and we're not purposely leveraging and harnessing, harnessing the power of these more strategic suppliers. Go back to our, to our two by two. You're strategic, we're gonna push you over and leverage you because you know what? We've got power. And so you are starting to see for example, more modern versions of the Krawczyk Matrix with A.T. Kearney's 64 checkerboard, but it's still based on basically the same premises, and it just chunks down incremental steps that we can do instead of really thinking sourcing is a business model. It's not just a series of little steps you, you can do or tactics, but it's the underlying architecture of these relationships. So a transaction-based relationship is different, it's a totally different architecture than a preferred supplier, than a performance-based supplier, than a vested supplier, or an internal um, investment-oriented shared services or a joint venture. So thinking of them as a sourcing business model and no matter who your supplier is, either yourself, a strategic supplier, or someone just you know, showing up to sell you pens or to be the janitor, you're going to treat them differently. You're going to manage them differently. You're going to treat the economics differently. So there's various factors that you have to look at to architect these relationships. And today, we're not architecting. We are wonderful buyers. We have perfected the art of buying. We are lousy at the art of architecting these relationships. Hmm. And I would say that a lot of businesses are looking for innovation and transformation, perhaps to the extent that the words 
have stopped really meaning anything. But you talk a lot about it as well. And how do you think businesses can overcome the paradox of actually saying they want innovation and transformation, but ending up with something else? Fantastic question. And that's where you have to get back to the architecture. Because most of the deals today are transactional nature. We say we have a strategic supplier, and then we buy it. A, a, a transaction. A wi- we buy per hour, per unit, per widget, per mile, right? Per kilogram, and we are not changing the underlying economics. So, a sourcing business model is made up of two factors: one, your contracting model, right? Your contracting relationship, and the second is the economic relationship. So, there are three types of relational, uh, if you think about the contracting relationship. There's a transactional relationship. Majority of deals today are transactional. There's what uh, is known as a hybrid or relational contract, very rarely used today. And so see the difference is where we say we want a strategic partner and strategic relationship. We say we want our supplier to invest in us, but we're contracting with transactional contracts, rigid, non-flexible frameworks per unit, per hour. And then the third component on that continuum is what we'll call investment-based, right? Investment-based contracting. This is where you would turn to joint ventures, subsidiaries. So you're choosing to invest in creating a, a contractual method. Even if it's a shared services, you should still treat that shared services as an still a supplier, it's just an internal supplier. So you've got this continuum, right? And it goes from transactional to relational to investment-based. And that actually, that component of sourcing business models stems from Dr. Oliver Williamson's Nobel Prize winning work on transaction-based economics. And what he challenges people is to really move up that continuum to more of these relational type contracts. Exactly what Peter Krawczyk said. Now, to get to the second component of a sourcing business model, you have to look at the economic relationship. There's, there's um, on the, the low end of the spectrum, right on this side, you've got transactional economics. Then you have output-based economics. And on the far end, you have outcome-based. So think about it this way. I'm buying an activity. I'm paying for an activity, transactional. I'm paying for the supplier to deliver deliver an output such as a guaranteed service level, SLAs, or an outcome as a business result. So when you pick and you architect these relationships, you have to understand both the relational model uh, as well as the economic model. Hmm. And I, I guess it can be daunting for any large organization, that it, even the mid-sized and small organizations. And I think that, and I've met with many managers who think that this sounds fantastic but when you try to sort of scratch the surface and look at their maturity level organizational wise they are not that mature so they themselves feel that like well this might be 10 years that we like it but it's 10 years ahead what advice do you give organizations that realize that that what you're saying is relevant and important but they can't really factor in how to to reach to that state? Well, I, I think there's two parts to that question. So one is, you know, I, and I do see that all the time. People say, Kate, this sounds really good, but we're not mature enough. We're not mature. And I, I look at it this way. This is my advice. You know what? You can take your maturity model and there's, take your pick. There's tons out there. And then you can wait to drive change until you change your infrastructure and you feel ready to drive change. But what we're seeing a lot of organizations to do, say, is they don't want to wait to put in the infrastructure for their whole entire organization. They want to build and create the infrastructure with with, um, a particular supplier, right? So let's take on that sourcing continuum some of our more strategic suppliers, step back and choose to move up that continuum to a performance-based or a vested deal and put the infrastructure in one at a time. So the biggest piece of infrastructure that you need to think about is the actual contract um, because these are going to be more flexible frameworks as you move to a performance-based or a vested deal, learning to create relational contracts. Well, that's not hard to do 
Um, we actually offer a, a class at the University of Tennessee called Collaborative Contracting. Come on down for two days and you will learn what a relational contract is. Um, and then the other part that, that is work and is a lot of change for an organization is the governance component because you're putting in the uh, mechanisms to help manage the supplier in a very different way. Um, and sometimes not even in a vested relationship, you're not even managing the supplier, you're managing the business with the supplier. And so those are two areas that you can, as I say, you know, learn and do. You don't have to wait for your entire infrastructure to move up the maturity curve to take one deal. One deal at a time. Learn and do, take in what you're learning, and then take it to another supplier and another supplier. Because as I shift those suppliers up the continuum, we're going to be able to create transformation. We're going to be able to create value. Because the more I move up that continuum, the more value is created. And on the far end is where we start to see the innovation and the transformation. Because we're not buying transactions. We're not even buying SLAs. We're buying true business outcomes. Well, thanks a lot, Kate. And I look forward to reading that book. Well, fantastic, and uh, I'm really excited to uh, share our knowledge, and we have a wonderful open source toolkit. So as you read through it and you want to see the tools that we're creating, we have chosen much the way Michael Porter did and Peter Krawczyk did is to give those tools away. And so we hope that that will motivate people that they can come and read, learn, and do. Learn and do. Use our business model mapping, see where you fall on the continuum, and jump, jump in and t try it out, move up the continuum. Learn and do. Thank you, Kate.